Thank you very much, Father Antonio. I um, was telling him as we were coming down that for me it's an anniversary, and for you with me, an anniversary, because it was 20 years ago that I published the first article in Comunio. Um, it was kind of on uh, uh, a fluke because I wasn't, I, I was looking for a place to publish uh, some thoughts I had outside of my technical field, which is, as you heard, Mesopotamia. And somebody suggested to uh, send it to Comunio, and David was very um, helpful in, uh, uh, first of all, accepting it, and then following me in the following years. So I've had this long-term relationship now with, uh, uh, with you all, and uh, I really appreciate it, as well as this culminating moment of uh, being able to give you these lectures which <clears throat> I thought might be, um, uh, might cover a, an area that is somewhat different from the ones you're normally used to, as you might expect, since, in fact, the last time I came, they uh, was invited to give a talk, and the beginning of the letter was, we know you're not a theologian, but, which is, <laughs> is still true today more than ever. And uh, so I, I like to, to sort of, make relevant, in a sense, uh, the work I've been doing on uh, Mesopotamia for uh, the world at large, uh, beginning with uh, JP2. So uh, that's the, uh, um, the goal of my, uh, of my lectures. The, some of the, present, of the topics I will mm, cover are technical, but intentionally so. Intentionally, not in the sense of um, overwhelming you with details that are pointless, but rather to give you a, a sense of the uh, substance that's behind the uh, inferences that uh, I want to draw. And uh, we uh, begin with uh, Plato, because I want to justify the title, the two and a half million years. Um, as you all know, um, Plato relates that uh, Solon uh, had given an account that he had heard from, uh, the, uh, from Egyptian priests about the antiquity of Athens. For verily at one time Solon, before the greatest destruction by water, what is now the Athenian state was the bravest in war and supremely well organized in all other respects. Of the citizens then who lived nine thousand years ago, which was a very long distance in time for Plato. I will declare to you briefly certain of their laws, etc. So if we are here today, <clears throat> Plato, some century or a couple of millennia before us, and he went back to 9,000 and it was an unfathomable past. Well, Augustine, uh, in the City of God, um, goes further back. Yet, even if we spoke not of five or six thousand years, but of sixty or six hundred thousand, or if one were to multiply by sixty or six hundred or six hundred thousand years, or if again we were to multiply to such a point where we had no name for this number of years that passed since God created man, even then we could, not, we could still ask why God did not create man before that time. So he goes back to, he, to a, a past which is indeed unimaginable. And he indicates that it's unimaginable but because he wants to put in, he wants to emphasize the distance from, or the, the, the sense of creation, of eternity in effect, which is beyond time. Well, today we know a lot more, obviously, than Plato and Augustine about the far distant past. What is this far distant past? Well, it is about two and a half million years when the species Homo uh, begins, and we will start a little later uh, just that with the evidence I'll give you later, which is still a million and 800,000 years ago. 
with some emphasis also on this 60,000, which serendipitously ends up being a particularly meaningful date. We will see why. Now, in each of the lectures, I will cover, uh, I'll go through a sequence of four points where I will first give you an archaeological window on some aspects that are particularly significant or from which I want to draw some very special inferences. Then I will speak of the cognitive dimension in general that can be derived from the evidence that I will have just shown. And in particular, the uh, way in which people could relate then to the absolute. And I use the term absolute instead of God intentionally because I want it to be as neutral as uh, possible. And all of this as a foundation for communal living. How is it that we uh, end up <clears throat> uh, understanding uh, the community of human beings in uh, very special ways. So I will start with the very old times of uh, the Paleolithic. And the first portion tonight will be on the evidence of stones and bones, which is essentially all that we have for the, particularly the lower Paleolithic, which is lower depositionally, archeologically, so the oldest in time. And then how did they know? So cognitive or if you want to use a more ambitious term, the epistemology of uh, the Paleolithic man, human hominins. What was their absolute? Did they, can we infer any um, sort of knowledge on their part of the absolute? And then the incipient communities that uh, we can uh, recognize. I will... Um, deal especially with two archaeological sites. One of which is well known, Old Dubai in uh, Tanzania in Africa, and the other which is uh, less well known simply because it's more recent, that is the more recent in terms of the findings, uh, the Manisi in uh, Georgia. Um, this is a view of uh, Old Dubai in Tanzania, uh, excavated by the uh, Leakies and very well known. And the other is the Manisi in the Republic of Georgia, so in the Caucasus, which has been excavated by Lord Kipanidze. And uh, incidentally, I owe much of my acquaintance with Manisi to my wife, Marion, because she is a specialist, not of Paleolithic Georgia, of much later, Bronze Age uh, Georgia, but uh, she was the one who um, helped me put together the material on uh, the Manisi. So these are the kind of uh, data that we have, uh, stone, lithic materials, lithic tools. Uh, these are from the two main periods of Old Dubai, so a million and eight hundred and a million two hundred. And I will go over these tools in some detail in a moment to show you the, even the archaeological method. How is it that we can uh, infer um, significant things? How can draw meaning out of these artifacts? And the other aspect besides the tools are the bones, and in this case especially the human uh, remains from Dwanisi. So these are the two windows that I will open uh, for you on the uh, Paleolithic age, particularly on this one. Uh, of course, we don't know names. They did not have names, in fact, because one running theme through the first two lectures in particular, is that there was no language at this point. They, were, they didn't speak. And, um, so, and they didn't call themselves D4500 either. <laughs> but uh, the reason there are two is because the mandible is set, was found separately, uh, tech physically, from the uh, skull. So this individual is D4500 plus D2600. 
And this is to give you an idea from the technical publication of the uh, uh, material of the kind of detail that uh, can be, uh, that is in, given in the uh, technical publication. So there is a lot, in other words, of uh, uh, research, as you can well imagine, behind these, uh, uh, this evidence. Now, the uh, recurrent theme on, uh, in the uh, presentations that I will give you is the fact that um, we uh, are dealing with what I call broken traditions. They um, were, um, they died at one point, they died out in the sense that there, were, there are no more and there haven't been uh, living carriers of this culture, of this tradition for a long, long time. In this case, million eight hundred years, eight hundred thousand years. <clears throat> but even for the Mesopotamians, which are much, much closer, only five thousand years ago, uh, we really don't have any living carriers. So the tradition, their cultural tradition, their notion of self-understanding is lost. We have nobody who can tell us how they feel about being Mesopotamians, much less about being D4500. <laughs> So it's a broken tradition. I like the, the term, in a sense, the metaphor of broken tradition, which is analogous to what we say when we speak of a dead language. But I don't like the term dead language because it implies that it, that it was a dead, but as it was very much alive, the language as it was this tradition. So it is broken in the sense that it was very much there, but it uh, was interrupted. <clears throat> And uh, this notion is particularly poignant for the uh, Paleolithic uh, uh, time period because it's sort of an extreme case of brokenness. And this image is very emblematic of um, what that means um, because we find these things archaeologically embedded in a matrix of soil, just like this skull in the pictures that you see here below. And we take them out of their depositional life, that is, they got there where they are now because of a depositional process, the, how they were uh, abandoned, discarded in some cases or whatever, and then how we uh, end up uh, finding them. So the uh, fact of being embedded in the soil is really very much emblematic of this distance. See, they were severed from us, and we recapture not only the physical evidence, but also what's behind it, the meaning. So that's the goal of archaeology, um, which leads us, of course, to interpretive, uh, uninterpretive paths, which can be risky and obviously controversial, and some of the thing, most of what I will present you, as a matter of fact, is controversial, there are, particularly because much of it is new. So there is still a lot of discussion uh, taking place. But it all starts there with the, 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 the moment of discovery uh, in the uh, ground. So in the, the big question, in a sense, for us is, who are these individuals? The term that is used is now is hominins. It used to be hominids. Hominins is a little more precise for some reasons that I won't go into. But the question is, what is the uh, link between them and us? Uh, is there a way of uh, uh, healing the brokenness, as it were, of bringing them back to uh, our own sensitivity? And I think there is. Um, we can um, deal with the cognitive issue. Cognitive archaeology is one of the great fields of archaeology at the moment. And it means precisely to try and understand the way in which a human or hominin mind worked when we have nobody to tell us how it actually works. <coughs> so. Um, the, I will now present you in some detail one aspect of this, 
which is the, uh, goes under the title of spatial competence. So this is the first of these few moments of technicality that I will lead you through, but with the purpose. It is based on, a, on the work of a uh, colleague, Thomas Swin, who in 89 published this book, The Evolution of Spatial Competence, which is not well known, even in the field, it's not particularly quoted, but which I consider very, very important, and I'll show you the reasons why, by giving you examples from this book. So all the images that follow immediately now are from his book. He goes into the analysis of the tools, um, trying to extract from very, in, very in a rigorous uh, manner, this uh, concept of space. How did they relate to the tools that they were making with a competence of the spatial relationship, hence the title of spatial competence. And he, uh, um, he does that by going through a series of steps that show their application of what he calls intuitive geometry, and he shows it in great detail. So let's look at some of his examples. The first one is this tool, and he analyzes it in terms of the um, nearbyness or a proximity of the trimming blows, the way in which the um, blows are uh, in, um, exerted on the uh, stone. And this is the simplest uh, example. They are all together, so they are very much near one to the other. There is a, or a beginning of a sense of uh, order and of organization, which becomes more and more explicit with the other examples he gives. In this case, the order is shown by pairing. The uh, blow given a uh, marked here as A comes before C, and B comes before D, and together they give a straight edge. So there is a organization of the blows. They are not accidental. They are not given haphazardly, as it were. And there is a single working edge that emerges from it. In this case, there is a straight edge that is marked, and so there is a sequence, a very clear sequence. To get the straight edge at the bottom, you need to have these blows that are one after the other. But in this case, there is a correction because this larger blow, which he marks with the arrow, comes afterwards. It's, uh, and you can tell that it's afterwards done afterwards because of the superposition of the blows, <laughs> of the, the traces. So the um, evidence here shows that there is a, we cannot really call it thinking in terms of uh, uh, a sequential reason, but reasoning, but there is a attempt at uh, getting things right by correcting. And then this happens also, you already can tell from these examples, but even more so from this one, that all of this happens on very small pieces. See, this is less than an inch wide and it has all of these blows. So the motor habit with which they were, uh, the motor control on, the, um, on these uh, specimens was extremely fine. There is a great deal of uh, skill that goes already at this very extremely early age. We can read now the uh, couple of sentences from uh, Wynne's analysis that introduce us to the next step, which is that of an ordered sequence. We have already seen a beginning of order in these blows that were given, that, were, that we have noticed on the stones. But here he says, the notion of an ordered sequence requires the coordination of proximity and separation with the addition of a constant direction of movement or orientation. If we want to create a series of elements, such as a line of posts 
So here he goes from the stone tool to posts in the ground. We must employ some concept in addition to separation and nearness, which is what we have seen so far. We must place the third element and all subsequent elements in some specific spatial relation to all of the preceding elements. We cannot simply place the third post near the second. We must also consider the position of the first. So the first post determines the position of the third. And this notion of sequence is, much, is different from what we have seen before. And now he, uh, and so he says there is a constant direction of this movement. And he now uh, exemplifies this on the stone tools. So we go back to the uh, specific stone tools. And in this case, the emphasis is on a straight line. You see that the blows are primarily on the two edges, which create a sharp edge that is straight, also in profile. So if you look at it from the front, it's also uh, straight, which means that there is a sense of perspective also that is beginning to develop. Uh, and incident, he, um, he goes on to show here the um, sense of symmetry because these blows are, as you see, not connected, the, the, the various sequences, they're not connected with each other. These four sequences are done just so that there be a symmetrical uh, shape and organization to the whole uh, object. Um, now, he has a nice remark, um, in fact, he has several of these remarks throughout his uh, volume. He says, quote, we need not envision the hominin in agonizing contemplation. So it's not as though they had a uh, abstract notion of what they, or that he claims that they had an abstract notion. But even quick on the spot planning required a notion of whole and part. This is fundamental and we'll come back to it in some detail in a minute, to this notion of the whole and the part. Another um, element of uh, analysis uh, from, of this uh, intuitive geometry has to do with measurement. Um, this is a, a discoid, it's a term we give to it. And what is significant about this is the constancy of the diameter. You see, uh, it, remi it remains the same throughout. So it's a sense of measurement, not in the sense that he was trying to achieve a five centimeter. Obviously, they did not have an extrinsic standard of measurement. But there was an intrinsic standard of measurement. So for this particular tool, the diameter remains constant throughout, uh, which is very much indicative, again, of a sense of the whole. Now here we come much later, only 300,000 years ago, Isimila, which is a site near Old Dubai, and uh, what it, uh, as you see, the, stone, the, the tools are beginning to be even more uh, finer in their um, uh, craftsmanship. But the point that he makes here in terms of this intuitive geometry is the sense of the cross-section. The cross-section remains the same throughout the, uh, here there is only one, but it's like an infinite series of cross-sections which remain the same. So the symmetry that we saw before in a sort of uh, two-dimensional sphere is now applied to the whole uh, instrument or to the tool as a whole, which means that there is an imagination behind it, that there is a, a, a notion of the relationship of the individual parts, a rather complex uh, series of uh, relationships, which are the individual cross-sections. And this appears also in this notion of the parallel axis. Um, the, this is um, a, a tool that is extensively trimmed, and so it's also indicative of the intentionality of the uh, blows that are uh, made and inverted to the 
uh, tool. Um, and intentionally, they wanted to get two straight edges at the two ends. So all of this then tells us that there is a uh, sense of uh, sequence in the production. And for this, the technical term that is used is the chaîne opératoire, which simply means a sequential chain of uh, uh, the process that is used to produce these uh, tools, but it's a term that has become technical in archaeology in particular. And this drawing shows the uh, sequence uh, of the uh, tool. So the, in order to obtain the finished tool, you have to go through a certain sequence. So the first five blows of A are then followed by the ones of B and then eventually by the one of C. The, uh, they're not random. That's it. The, the process, it's not only that the final configuration of the tool is the way we saw before, but also that there is a uh, sequence in the process by which they are made. So all of this takes us now to some important inferences. We have seen that this development of a competence of space, of how things were produced. And the one thing that we can get out of it for our purposes is this sense of structure. The uh, object is clearly perceived as a whole, but it's perceived as a whole before it's made. So there is a sense of structure when you're facing the raw material. And remember that there is no language at this point. So there is no way of um, uh, relating, of expressing the things that, as I have been saying, or explaining them to each other. But we can infer this uh, sense of structure because of the details that we have just seen in terms of the spatial competence, and also because of the great repetitiveness of the shapes, uh, the size of the inventory that we find at uh, these uh, sites, in particular at Manisi. Manisi is important uh, also for this reason, because it has uh, about 10,000 uh, pieces in a very small area, physical, physic, um, spatially, and also chronologically they come at a, a fairly um, uh, limited period of time. So uh, let's try now, what I would like to try and explain to you is my understanding of how this development of a sense of structure would have taken place. There is a physical perception based on senses, on sensation, of the raw material. So you view a stone block. And you anticipate the structure of the finished tool. And I call this a parallel type of perception or para-perception, meaning that it is not given by the senses. You don't have a, a view of the tool when you see, you don't perceive it physically when you perceive the uh, stone, the stone block, but you anticipate the uh, finished product and as a result, you actually produce it. So the um, this process whereby you link the two, the raw material, with the sense of structure, with the finished product, we may refer to as bracing, the linking of perception and paraperception, which allows you to then come up with the tool itself. And 
One thing also that uh, we can see happening is the sense of experimentation. There is a uh, very um, definite effort at um, changing things and um, at um, improving. Uh, and the way in, in which we may think this happened was by comparing different paraperceptual templates, as it were. So it's not accidentally that they come up with a parallel but different uh, objects, which are then again very repetitive. As I was telling you before, there is a very clear taxonomy that has a very clear uh, sequence or series of objects which are which can be typologically put together, and the um, so that essentially they all, even though they're all different one from the other, they all match the same template, as it were. And this is the paraperception, what I call a paraperception. We cannot really call it a mental template in the sense of a uh, reasoned and articulate. Um, template, uh, again, because there is no language and therefore also no logical thought. We'll come to this in the next uh, talk. But in other words, the link between logic and language, uh, which happens um, very late, about 60,000 years ago. So we don't have any of that at this point, but there is this uh, ability to create classes of objects which are typologically the same, even though each individual piece is, of course, different from the other. They're not machine-made. So uh, from this uh, notion of a sense of structure that develops, we can draw further implications, which take us even more into in the interpretive realm, but which are, uh, at least can be argued, can be supported by the evidence that we have looked at in some detail. A precondition of uh, all of this is that there is a memory of the sense of structure. The uh, um, the template, this uh, paraperceptual, as I call it, template that I uh, showed you, is a, uh, not just uh, there for one moment, but there is a lasting ev uh, event, as it were, in memory. So there is a lasting sense of structure. It's not just a one-time deal. It's the same thing that remains. And as we will see in a minute, there can be also communicated to others. So memory is, I think, um, has to be evinced from what we have seen so far. We may also think of awareness. Again, not the logical kind of awareness, the articulate kind of awareness that we have, but the awareness of a intentionalized and internalized structure. So there is some kind of uh, relationship to the image that one has uh, when producing these uh, tools, which also means that there is a possibility of error because remember the notion of bracing, that is you link the stone block that you have in front of you with a mental template, with a paraperceptual template of the tool you want to uh, get out of it, and you may make a mistake. Uh, there is no error in perception, but there can be an error in paraperception, especially in the bracing between the two, which is one reason why animals don't make mistakes, but we do, and they did the hominins did, which takes us also then to the more ambitious uh, <clears throat> implication or inference 
that of freedom. Because if you can make mistakes and if there is a risk, then there is also the possibility of choosing and therefore of uh, uh, the need to be free in the choice of what you do. Um, but a perception is really not um, automatic. <coughs> and uh, you can um, alter it, which is also why experimentation happens, as we saw. All of which does not happen in the animal world. If a bee does the wrong honeycomb, it's not because they are experimenting with a different honeycomb. It's because there is a disease, something goes wrong. But in fact, there hasn't been any experimentation on the part of bees for new honeycombs ever. And the same goes for all of these very complex systemic products of the animal world. So the paraperception uh, dimension, paraperceptual ability of the hominins entails freedom, entails the ability to make mistakes. And this is what we may term impure reason, uh, but in a uh, positive sense. So not as in uh, David's title um, of Plato's uh, critique of impure reason, but in the sense that it is impure in the sense that it is pure paraperception. Um, and it is extremely difficult for us, nearly impossible, it would seem, to have a critique of impure reason in this sense, or a critique of pure paraperception, because we are contaminated by pure reason, <laughs> um, which we will, uh, about which we will speak uh, the next time around, which will be precisely the beginning of reasoning and the development of pure reason. So it's almost more difficult than uh, dealing, than doing a critique of pure reason, because we are enmeshed in language and logic. And therefore, it's very difficult to um, disentangle us, as it were, from this categorical uh, bent that uh, we have. But. Um, to some extent, we can try to, to a limited extent. And uh, so we can engage for a moment in a critique of pure paraperceptual reason. The um, sense of structure that we have been uh, discussing is if the analysis I've been proposing is valid, pre-linguistic. So it's also pre-logical. And the sense of structure that we still have can be attributed to that. That is, can be something that goes beyond or before the ability that we have to dissect reality as we do with uh, the logical and linguistic thinking. Another aspect is the um, simultaneity. That is, there is no sequential articulation of the steps. The chain opératoire about which we spoke before was not articulated mentally because, again, there was no language and no logical thought. But there was a sequence of things. So this sequence was understood in a uh, not in a sequential way, but in a simultaneous way. That is, it was clear that things had to happen in a certain way because the structure was present as a final cause. It was very clear all along. Each step was conditioned and uh, brought about, in effect, by this sense of the final clause, a cause of the uh, structure of the object. So with this in mind, we can go on to the next step, and we 
become more and more interpretive uh, in what we are saying and uh, seeing. That is, was there a sense of the absolute? And I will answer yes, but in a very uh, down-to-earth, as it's proper for an archaeologist, in a very down-to-earth manner. Um, you see, the lithic, the lithic tool that is produced transcends the contingency. That is, they are not producing the object because there is an immediate contingent need but because there is a need for a supply for the future. And this is evidenced by the, uh, again, the inventories that we have, uh, that we have found. Uh, there is a, a sense of the anticipating future needs and possible non-contingent problems. There is not something which is a danger immediately at hand, but something which will come on later on. So in a very, uh, as a flickering notion, as it were, of the confrontation with something that lies beyond. But we really have no evidence for an articulate relationship with this other. So there is no evidence in a sense of, an, of religion, of an antiquity, of a articulate religion. There is no evidence, not that they didn't have it, but I don't see evidence for it. The, uh, what we, there is no evidence for a, a formalization of this ordering principle. There is a sense of the ordering principle and the sense also of something that goes beyond, I'll come back to this in a minute, but there is no uh, real indication of a dialogue, as it were, of, with these uh, individuals. Uh, things like uh, burials, uh, formalized burials, are much later, uh, at, at least uh, the very end of our period, 300, 200,000 years ago, which is very late in comparison to what we have seen. But let's develop a little more this sense of going beyond. Um, the, we have talked about the ordering principle of structure and we have talked about bracing. So I'll put on again this uh, slide that we have just uh, seen before. The point now is that the bracing has a limit. That is, there is a, it, it appears as a barrier. You can only brace certain things, but there are many things, in fact, most things were unbraceable. They could not be brought together. And the, there is an urge to go beyond, which is the whole experimentation thing that we have seen before. But there is also a sense that we cannot control everything because, I mean, we, but I am projecting this onto them, that there were things that could not be braced, could not be dealt with. So there is a, uh, in this sense, we can think of a, or assume, an awareness of an absolute, of something that is beyond the immediate possible, or the immediate control or even the possibility of control. Um, because there is a great deal that is somehow controlled outside of us or of them. There is an external uh, referent. What we see here, it seems to me, is the beginning of what I like to call the grand homeostatic construct that is human culture. Homeostatic in the sense that it is auto-referential. 
that it tends to, uh, to concentrate of what can be controlled from within. And what is outside is either ignored or uh, faced in some, uh, some other way than through the bracing system which allows us to bring it together and therefore to control it. So either we ignore it or we accept it as something beyond. And this sense of beyond, in a way, is what I am uh, suggesting was there already. Just the sense that there was something that could not be brought under the control of, uh, um, of bracing. And I'll give you two concrete examples where we can understand this a little better. Um, Sorry, I don't have a, um, The first is that the, um, it's something very, again, very concrete, but that I think you'll be surprised at. We have seen the stone tools, okay? Now, we, these the were very small communities. We'll talk about community in a second, but very small groups of people. Imagine that in all of Europe, it is assumed that in the, towards the end of this uh, lower Paleolithic, there were only about 6,000 individuals in all of Europe. So there were extremely small bands or groups of people. And the, we have no indication of, in, of uh, <clears throat> large settlements at all, or even of settlements, actually. Anyway, there were very small groups. Now think of the stone tools that we just saw before you'd think that they would just pick them up within a small area where they lived. Well, no, there is evidence that they went as far as 40 kilometers to get the material for their tools. And they would bring them back to the place where they lived. Which means that there is a sense of procurement, of distant uh, procurement where you go in order to get something very specific, and therefore you also have the sense that it's something beyond, that you don't know how to get to, and you don't care either because you have enough with what you have inside your 40 kilometers uh, radius. But still, it's indicative of the wide range and the limited range at the same time. So the... Um, they have a sense of exploration, as it were, and of the beyond. And this liminality, the sense of the boundary, so because in a sense this indicates that they have a conception of territory of some sort, not as developed by any means as we will see the next time when we come to quote-unquote civilization, but they have a sense of the territory, of the boundaries of where you live. But there is another limit, which is death. This is another one of the skulls from the Manisi, D 3444. And um, it's very, very remarkable because you may already have noticed he has, or she, we don't know, has no, this individual has no teeth. But what is remarkable is that this person, or this individual, this hominin, lived for two years, at least, without teeth, when he was very old, which means about 30 years of age. So, uh, no, notice, that there, you must know that there was no fire at this point, that they were living in the Caucasus, in the mountains, so it's, this is from Tmanisi. So it's very cold. Um, a person might be able to survive alone, but certainly um, it, it would seem that without any cooking available, that there would have been somebody who was caring for this person. And if that was the case, if there were others who were assisting this very old person, 30 years of age, 
very old. He was, about, he was about to die anyway, but the point is that he lived for two years with this presage of death. This is a reconstruction, a forensic reconstruction, which has been done with very, a lot of care, so it's not just fantasy of uh, men of the woman based on the remains from um, um, the Manisi. Um, the sense of incoming death, living for two years with a person who is very weak, extremely weak, because the lack of teeth indi would indicate that, a general weakness, and therefore the approaching of death and the feeling of this liminality, the liminality in time. So we have seen the liminality in space with the procurement of the objects and the liminality in time with the approaching death. Which takes us to the last point, which will be very brief because we know little about it, just as we knew little about the absolute, but we'll do our best, we do our best to extract a lot out of little. Um, the uh, notion of uh, community, um, in some ways, <coughs> in some ways, takes us back to the concept of uh, bracing. It is, it's a form of social bracing, that is, of relating to other individuals over a long period of time, not just occasionally, but and to, to relate to them as uh, individuals. This is another view of the same two individuals. Um, now, if you think about it, 30 years of age, no matter how early they would have made it, means, it's interesting if you think about it, that there really were no grandparents. Which means also that th there was an uh, even lesser opportunity for memory, for uh, social memory. Apart from the fact that there was, again, no language, and so no way of communicating things through language. But there was also no um, recognition of events or of uh, phenomena in nature that an older person could recognize if it had no longer, if it hadn't happened in a while. So the social bracing, in other words, is even more difficult because the, the sense of identity is very much built on social memory. And this is very, very fragile, very limited. But nevertheless, we can um, assume that there was. And one way to look at this is through the transmission of the skills, education. See, education is the transmission of a template. So the teacher and the pupil, let's say, or the craftsman and the apprentice, share the same mental template, the same paraperceptual template of a tool. And therefore, this individual can do the same tool. Same in quotes, because obviously they are different. But same in terms of typology, of uh, taxonomically, they're taxonomically the same, even though physically they're quite different. Um, remember that this was not, they, that these tools were not done for contingent reasons, because they were stored. There were inventories available on hand. So they had a uh, uh, concern about uh, long-term availability. And these inventories have their own internal coherence, taxonomic coherence, if you will, which is shown even by just these two examples. Uh, so they're very much the same. They correspond to the same kind of template. So what they are sharing the craftsman and the uh, apprentice is the same paraperceptual ability. And uh, this could not be, cannot be accounted for purely mechanically or genetically, but really because there are too many differences at the same time that there are too many uh, similarities. So we can uh, say that 
there is here already a syntactical disposition or a predisposition, even in the pre-linguistic uh, stage, to uh, sharing not only things, but also the processes through which these things were brought about, were done. So, um, education means then that there is a sense of uh, community. Of, because remember that this transmission is a cultural transmission. It's not a genetic transmission. In fact, the term that is used sometimes is tectonic, meaning that it is, that there is, it's not tied to genetic um, traits, but to constructive, uh, constructional, in the, if you want to translate tectonic, constructional elements. So there is something which, in the way in which things are done, which is shared and communicated. So the, um, there is a sense then of uh, community. These are the five skulls found in Dmanisi. We already know the two that are named <laughs> there. Um, what is remarkable about them and what is unique is that uh, uh, they are found within a uh, relatively short stratigraphic setting. So in other words, it's the um, best documented example of this for the Paleolithic age. Namely, they belong to the same horizon, to the same temporal uh, horizon. So anyway, these five uh, individuals shared a lot, as you have come to see. And we can, I think, rightly say of them that no hominin is an island. It's not just <laughs> uh, that there was already a sense of, uh, of uh, belonging together, a social bracing culture, then. There is a called human hominin culture. There is also this cultural transmission, which is tradition. The ability to hand down a, some kind of embryonic social memory. Um, there is no sense, as I said, really of identity. In the, we cannot assume uh, the kind of identity that we have later on when the lifespan becomes longer and when there are <clears throat> more means of communicating language above all, but there is more than just the accidental use of certain um, you know, traits of certain things done. There is a real uh, tradition. And there is also progress, something else which we don't have in the animal world. It's almost nil for the Paleolithic age. You know, two and a half million years is a long time. <laughs> Um, we figured out in terms of generations between um, uh, us and Christ, it's about 60, I think. And between Christ and th uh, the earliest uh, phase here, it's about 60,000. So it's, a, it's an enormous amount of time, span of time. And there is hardly any progress. Hardly, though. There is some even in this same period. And you have even seen it in the little bit that I have shown you. And it's not only so much a matter of really great technological developments, but this constant uh, sequence of uh, uh, changes that are indeed uh, cultural and not just uh, evolutionary in a genetic sense. All of this, in some ways, it seems to me, points to the humanness of hominins. That is, um, if we look at one aspect as the, that links us to them, is the ability to link things that are not contiguous in time or space. This ability of, to brace paraperceptually elements of reality that are not together is there. And that is our 
great gift of creativity that we have as human beings, and they had it too. So in that respect, there is, a, it seems to me, a strong sense of, uh, of continuity. So it is in this sense that we can have a full-blown reconstruction of one of these individuals bidding us goodbye uh, for tonight. <laughs> she is a woman. Um, as I said, the reconstructions are quite accurate, at least they're very, done very much in consultation with the uh, archaeologists who have excavated the uh, remains. She's not exactly saying goodbye because she's throwing a stone. But, uh, <laughs> but we'll ignore that. Um, and now to uh, anticipate <laughs> a little pitch for the next lecture, um, we have seen the, what has happened over these two and a half million years. We have had a window on the data, something about the epistemology, the way in which their minds worked, this uh, paraperceptual reason the possibility of uh, postulating a, a notion of the absolute, and the communal bonds. What we will see next is first I called it the invention of society, which is really the beginning of logical and linguistic, logical thought and language, and how this set in motion civilization, which we uh, make for which we give as a beginning date the origin of cities, generally, but which indeed goes back much further, I think, namely to the beginning of language. So I'll show the um, connection between language, uh, then the beginning of civilization with writing, which is, uh, in terms of uh, cognition, an enormous step forward, and how this impacts on all of the uh, sequence of um, events uh, down to our own times. The impact of wholeness instead takes us back to the, uh, in a sense, takes us back to paraperception. In the second uh, stage, this invention of society, we will deal with the I will bring out the, how the uh, beginning of language and of logical thought brings about the fragmentation of reality, and the, which begins already with bracing and the paraperceptual distinction between the raw material and the sound, but which becomes immensely exaggerated and larger with logical thought. So um, there is a breaking down into constituent elements of everything and the control in, uh, that we get uh, on that is exponential. But one tends to lose a sense of wholeness. One of the great themes of David's book on, on Plato is this great emphasis on wholeness. And this wholeness is uh, brought out uh, in the, uh, as I will try to show, uh, in the essentially in the biblical tradition. Um, and I will look at it from a, uh, let's say, a historical point of view, not from the point of view of, from a theological point of view, but really what it means is a juxtaposition or contraposition, in effect, to fragmentation, the sense of wholeness of uh, reality um, and the relationship to that. The last will be really just an epilogue. Um, uh, I will talk about the epistemology of paradise. <laughs> um, that is the city, a kind of a re-reading of the city of God that is of um, the uh, ultimate stage of the human community um, in terms of um, the fulfillment, as it were, of, this, uh, um, of these uh, early stages that we have seen. It will just be a short epilogue, um, but one that will, in a sense, help to make sense of what we have seen uh, in the first um, um, 
three uh, stages. So hopefully you'll be with me also in the next meetings. Thank you.